All right, so Let's roll. tonight's program was funded in part by a grant from Humanities New York with support from the National Endowment for the Humanities. And um, it's Dr. Daniel Way presenting how the B-29 ended World War II and saved a million lives. Um, during his talk, he's gonna talk about his father's experience in the South Pacific during World War II. And um, well, Dan, I'll, I'll let you uh, go while I start muting some people here real quick. Okay. Um, so this uh, talk is about how the B-29 ended World War II. I think a lot of people are vaguely aware of the role the bomber played, but uh, uh, I think there's a lot of drama and uh, history involved that most people aren't aware of. And as luck would have it, uh, my father was right in the thick of the whole process of how the B-29 ended the war. If there's any veterans out there, I'd like to uh, thank you for your service to our country. But the um, uh, as I said, the reason I'm, I was so interested in sharing my, uh, uh, sharing this piece of World War II history is because my father, uh, Technical Sergeant uh, Donald Way, was uh, involved with making uh, the uh, bombing maps for the B-29. And um, the, um, the more I researched the documents and pictures and memorabilia that he brought back from the war, the more interested uh, I became. The, um, the fact is that it's almost a miracle that the plane did what it had to do. It was um, a boondoggle from the beginning, but they somehow made it work. Uh, so my father was uh, uh, in the 949th engineering company of the 20th Air Force, and he was stationed on uh, Guam. He um, met my mother in college. Uh, they met in uh, Syracuse University and they got married uh, six months before the war started. And as you can see from the newspaper, the newspaper on the right shows uh, the list, it had a list of all the graduates from Syracuse, including both of my parents. And if, as you can see, the headline is, be ready for war graduates told. So it turned out my father was ready because he was majoring in geology at Syracuse University. And he was very adept at map making and, and uh, geography and so on. So he ended up uh, after a year of training stateside uh, in, in uh, Guam. Uh, he was a native of Niagara Falls, so it was quite a strange climate for him. But uh, if you can see, uh, my father is this guy right here. And here he is again uh, at the headquarters of the 20th Air Force. So this is what the PX looked like, and this is what the base looked like that he was on. Guam had been taken back from the Japanese during the, the, the battles of uh, the Marianas Islands, including Saipan, Tinian, and Guam. And uh, so he spent the, the remainder of the war there. Uh, they, they had to uh, put, their, uh, put the uh, cartographic skills to good use to make the bombing maps for the uh, B-29s. Um, he got there in late November of 1944, which was still only a, a few months after the Japanese had been routed from the island. And uh, he um, took this picture of the, for, of the, uh, the uh, base from the top of a Quonset hut, which he had helped to build. The, uh, the Quonset huts came in big boxes and they literally had to put those buildings together themselves. Uh, this map here shows the strategic location of the Marianas Islands and their relationship to the uh, home uh, islands of Japan. Let me go back here for a minute. Uh, so Saipan is uh, further north than Guam. Uh, Tinian is a little further north than Saipan, but these islands are 1,500 miles away from Japan. But their, their, their goal was to take the war to the home islands of Japan. Uh, they had to figure out how they were going to defeat the Japanese without invading uh, the home islands. 
So they developed the Boeing B-29 uh, specifically to play the part of uh, ending the war in the Pacific. Uh, before the B-29 was built, there was no other airplane that had ever been built that could serve that purpose. They're, the planes weren't big enough, they didn't fly far enough, they didn't have the sophisticated um, navigational abilities, and they couldn't fly high enough to avoid uh, Japanese anti-aircraft fire and uh, fighters. In fact, uh, before the B-29 was developed, the, these were the two main bombers in our Air Force, the B-24, which is up on the top, and the B-17, which is on the bottom. They both were very reliable uh, bombers. Uh, they were built in huge quantities. Uh, they made over 18,000 of the B-24s. They, uh, they built 17,000 B-17s during the war, but they couldn't fly far enough, and they couldn't fly high enough, and they couldn't carry enough payload to be able to uh, create a serious threat to the Japanese home islands. Uh, so here is a comparison between the B-17 and the B-29. They were both made by Boeing. You can see the wingspan, the wing area, the length uh, of the B-29 dwarfed the B-17. If you look at the image on the left, you can see the silhouettes of the planes and how, how much bigger the B-29 was than the B-17. And you can also see the difference in the loaded weight uh, almost uh, 70,000 uh, pounds heavier than the B-17 with a full load of uh, bombs. Uh, total horsepower was almost twice as much and range was more than twice as much. It, uh, the B-29 had to be able to fly over 5,000 miles uh, because of the distance between the Marianas Islands and the Japanese home islands. So the um, it, was, it would be uh, the largest plane ever built during the war, and uh, it was the biggest plane ever built up to that point. It was uh, developed uh, from in less than 19 months from the final specifications to the first prototype. It was the first very long range bomber that was designed to fly in those, uh, meet those specifications, and they, it had to be able to carry 20,000 pounds of bombs. That's 10 tons of bombs over 5,000 miles. So the, uh, it wasn't an easy job. The, uh, the B-29 was designed by Boeing, uh, but they farmed out some of the production to other manufacturers like Bell and Martin uh, in Seattle, Atlanta, and Omaha. Uh, they created enormous factories that ran around the clock, 10-hour shifts, six days a week. And by the end of the war, almost 4,000 B-29s had been built. The uh, B-29 was still wor in a work in progress when it first it flew combat mission in uh, uh, China in June of 1944. It was only 20 months after its first uh, test flight, which is a, a record. Uh, there still were a lot of bugs uh, in the plane, though, and of the first 97 B-29s built, only 16 were airworthy due to problems with uh, engines, lack of spare parts, uh, and wing support, and other problems. Uh, for the first few months, uh, the B-29s were based in China uh, because we had not yet taken over the Marianas Islands. We had no islands to fly from, so they had to fly from China all the way to Japan. They had to fly over the Himalaya Mountains, uh, and these were with uh, planes that were still not uh, completely uh, free of bugs and problems, they, uh, especially from lack of spare parts. So the, the losses were enormous, and uh, it, was, it was just a a disaster until they were able to get their own air dedicated airfields closer to the home islands. And so it wasn't until the fall of 1944 that the B-29s had airfields within range on Guam, Saipan, and Tinia, but they were still 1,500 miles away from Japan. Uh, and each plane cost $1 million to build, which doesn't sound like a lot now, but that's four times as much as any previous bomber had ever cost to build. And it contained uh, enormous amounts of wiring, uh, hundreds of thousands of rivets and electrical connections, and it held enough uh, fuel to uh, uh, fill 300 automobiles. Uh, and the Wright Cyclone engine, which uh, was powered the plane, was a, a, a very experimental engine. It was made of aluminum instead of steel uh, because it was supposed to be more lightweight 
it had to be able to provide one horsepower per pound of weight. The problem with the, the uh, magnesium metal in the uh, engine was that if it overheated, it would catch on fire. And the magnesium metal fire was almost impossible to extinguish. Uh, and even when the engine worked properly, it usually would only last about 10 missions before it had to be replaced. But on the other hand, new innovations that had never been used before on a large airplane include pressurized and heated cabins, uh, uh, computer-controlled uh, um, anti-aircraft uh, guns, um, and other amazing um, uh, innovations, uh, dual bomb bays, uh, radar controlled bombardments, etc. Um, it was so streamlined uh, that when the landing gear was dropped, it cut its, it uh, increased its drag by 50%. It was so sophisticated and the air crews were so poorly trained that uh, many accidents occurred early in the, in the uh, plane's career. Many early crews, the, the B-29s were so few and far between that many uh, crews that were training for it had to train on B-24s and B-17s. Uh, General LeMay, who was in charge of the 20th Air Force, described the B-29 as the buggiest darn airplane that ever came down the pike. And of the uh, 402 B-29s which were lost during the war, uh, almost 60% were due to engine fires and mechanical failures. And in fact, uh, aviation uh, during the war was a very deadly uh, operation in general. Almost 15,000 men were killed by aviation training accidents, which almost matched the casualties of Iwo Jima and Okinawa combined. But um, so early in the um, career of the plane, uh, engine fires occurred while performing power checks on takeoff, the engines would heat up so fast that they would catch on fire before the plane would even take off. Um, they had to, uh, the, the test pilot who was helping to develop the B-29 actually was killed when an engine fire caused his, the wing of his plane to fall off. So that's how bad things were. And many of the uh, men refused to fly the B-29. Colonel Tibbetts, who ended up flying the Enola Gay that dropped the first atomic bomb, was in charge of the B-29 uh, pilot program and convinced two female WASP pilots, that's uh, women's uh, Air Force uh, service pilots, uh, were trained by, by uh, uh, Tibbetts, Paul Tibbetts, to fly the plane and become instructors for the male pilots. Uh, he didn't tell the, the two women that the engines were prone to fires, but he did tell them how to avoid overheating the engines before takeoff. So eventually they, uh, the women were, it took them three days to learn how to fly the plane and uh, it was a big success. It sort of changed the whole uh, game after that. This is a map that my father brought back from the war. It shows the island of Guam and you can see up on the uh, top the, uh, the location of the base that he was at. The uh, B-29s were the, uh, the bomber command were right next to his um, 949th unit. Meanwhile, the uh, U.S. Navy and the Pacific headquarters were down at the southern end of the island where Admiral Nimitz was. So there was a lot of stuff going on on Guam. Um, these are some pictures that my father had taken of himself, uh, including a beefcake pose for the benefit of my mother who was uh, back home. And uh, he, uh, he wrote a letter to her um, that described what it was like being on the tropical island. He said, by now you know that I've reached my destination safely and must have a pretty good idea of where I am. I called it pretty close, didn't I? We are still busy working on our company area, uh, putting in sidewalks, planting coconut sprouts, and building the mess hall and work rooms. There are, they are the uh, half round types as is so often pictured. They come as a huge kit and when the structure is complete, there are no pieces left over. I doubt if we can do much real work for another month, during which time most everyone is impatient to set up actual operations. Wherever you find the jungle, you find all sorts of the weirdest, most fantastic, and most verdant forms of plant life possible. The most impressive thing about the jungle is the feeling of oppressiveness and foreboding it gives you. One might think of it as a thing of beauty, and it is when you look skyward to see the sun shining down through the leaves, the wild orchids and ferns. But when you look earthwards, you feel as though you have seen the hand of death itself. 
Everything that touches the ground is either dead or dying, rotten, rotting, or being borne away by the ants. It gives you the creeps, especially when you happen to across a dead Japanese body. So that's uh, what life was like on Guam. But his, his uh, base, his, his camp was literally right next to the airfields for the B-29s. And uh, so he was able to get some great uh, pictures of the uh, airplanes and uh, he brought these back. Uh, he also, he didn't fly on the B-29s, but he was able to get pictures uh, taken by uh, crewmen, uh, as, as you can see in the picture in the center. So he, uh, he brought back a lot of photographs during the war. Uh, this is his group of uh, men uh, on Guam. And uh, let's see, you can see my dad is right here. Uh, he had to learn all kinds of technical things from uh, reading manuals. Uh, he brought back all these manuals from the war, uh, most of which are pretty tough reading, but uh, the, the amount of information that he had to absorb was just incredible. He also had manuals from the B-29 uh, itself, not that he was ever on the, in the crew, but just to familiarize himself with the characteristics of the plane uh, and its uh, capabilities. Uh, he brought back photographs, aerial photographs of Japan, including Mount Fuji. These are pictures that he uh, took of his men, uh, the men in his group, making the bombing maps. They would take aerial photographs and they would sort them out and make composites out of them. Then he, this is my father, uh, using uh, tweezers to make tiny little three-dimensional uh, maps of cities that uh, were exact replicas taken from aerial photographs. And uh, they would use all kinds of materials to build these, these incredible maps that were six feet wide on pieces of round plywood. And then they would uh, take photographs of the maps that they built with the light shining on the surface of the map in the same direction that the sun would be coming so that the bomber, uh, bombardiers and navigators on the B-29s could orient themselves to uh, where the targets were. And then they would print them uh, in these gigantic printing presses. Uh, you can see in the lower right picture, there's a, a stack of maps uh, piled up in the foreground. And these are what the maps uh, looked like. Uh, they were uh, incredibly detailed. They're, they're works of art, actually, and uh, they're six feet across. Uh, these are some uh, more urban uh, target um, maps. Uh, this one is a, um, a Nakajima aircraft factory. Uh, and uh, here is where you can compare an aerial photograph on the left with uh, the, the man-made, um, the handmade map on the right to show you the incredible detail. And you can even look at the shadows uh, of the um, oil tankers, the oil tanks here, and the shadows here to see how the picture was taken uh, with this light coming from the same direction. Uh, these were other kinds of maps that uh, were used uh, for the navigators. Um, uh, this is uh, the Tokyo area. Uh, here's a Mitsubishi aircraft engine factory. Um, and uh, so even when they were, um, the B-29s were in the Mariana Islands, the, uh, they, the losses were still high due to the difficulty fl uh, with flying conditions, the, the winds, uh, the jet stream winds were incredibly powerful. They had to fly 3,000 miles round trip to the nearest part of Japan and sometimes 4,000 miles and even further. Uh, they had ongoing mechanical problems. Planes were often overloaded with fuel and bomb, bay, bomb payloads uh, uh, beyond their specifications. So there were continuing to be accidents. Many planes were lost at sea. Uh, and uh, the initial strategy was to use high altitude uh, bombing, pinpoint bombing like they were using in Europe to hit uh, specific uh, factories and buildings. Uh, but uh, the accuracy was uh, still a problem because again of the jet stream and they were flying at 40,000 feet altitude to escape away uh, from the Japanese fighter planes and the anti-aircraft fire. But in the process, the bombs had to fall so far, they would fall through the jet stream winds. And uh, so accuracy was a problem as was uh, bad weather. Um, and uh, once the, they did hit the target, uh, the later planes had trouble seeing through the uh, smoke. 
So they had to change their strategy later to low altitude incendiary bombings instead. And that's when the war really took a turn in favor of uh, uh, our B-29 forces. Uh, this is what a, 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 a radar map uh, looks like. Uh, they would fly using radar uh, on the targets so they could see the targets through uh, cloud cover. And uh, the purpose was not to hit a specific building or factory, but to hit a, a city. And uh, the cities, as you know, were made of um, wood and paper and they burned like matchsticks. And so firebombing became a standard procedure uh, later in the war. Now, along the way, uh, the losses were continuing to be severe and uh, the, the higher up um, uh, brass were wondering how could we reduce the loss of aircraft. Many of the planes just would disappear and never uh, return back to base. Uh, they, you know, when you think about them flying over the Pacific Ocean with no landmarks, the navigator had to be absolutely spot on to be able to uh, get them safely back to the tiny little Marianas Islands. And a lot of them never, never showed up. They just uh, disappeared off the screen and uh, never were seen again. So it was decided that uh, we needed to get uh, a place where these planes could land somewhere between Japan and the Marianas Islands in case they were having engine trouble or, or navigational problems, which is why we needed the island of Iwo Jima, because as you can see on this map, it's literally halfway between Japan and uh, Guam. So it was felt that Iwo Jima would be uh, a useful asset to uh, take away from the Japanese. Now, Iwo Jima was a Japanese home island. So uh, it was felt that the Japanese would defend it uh, fiercely, but uh, the um, uh, reconnaissance air, air photographs that were taken uh, to uh, study the target uh, showed very little activity on the uh, on the surface of the island and there was very little foliage so it looked like uh, it would be easy pickings to invade the island. Of course what they didn't realize was that uh, the island had many tunnels and and uh, caves underneath the surface which uh, our men were uh, unfortunately not aware of the, the uh, degree of uh, uh, defenses that the Japanese had built there. Uh, so as you well know from history, Iwo Jima was no uh, cakewalk, it was a bloodbath. Um, I met, I had the honor of meeting a number of veterans who fought on Iwo Jima, including these two gentlemen here who were in the 4th Marine Division, Tom uh, Smith and Sal Famulero in the 4th Marine Division. Um, the uh, kind of combat they were used to was sitting in these holes, uh, some of these were uh, Japanese cave entrances and foxholes that they would have to uh, uh, use flamethrowers in to uh, to uh, uh, scatter the Japanese and so on. And uh, uh, both of them were wounded during the battle. Uh, the man on the left was able to to finish uh, uh, stay in in the fight until the uh, end of the campaign. But uh, Sal Famulaire on the right uh, was wounded uh, uh, on the ninth day but he obviously survived. Uh, this is George Beyerbach, who was in the 5th Marine Division. He was a uh, howitzer gunner. And uh, the picture uh, on the upper right corner shows uh, his unit in action uh, there with the howitzers, which they had to bring ashore on those uh, uh, amphibious ducks. The, uh, the howitzers weighed over 4,000 pounds and had to be lifted out of the duck and placed on the beach with a crane uh, under fire and George had to do that and he had bullets whizzing around his head and the fact that he survived is amazing. Um, this is George Jensen who was uh, in an artillery unit. Uh, he would have to creep ahead of the uh, front lines uh, with a telephone uh, wire uh, to phone in coordinates for the artillery to hit various targets. It was a very dangerous operation. He was unarmed himself and um, he dodged, literally dodged many bullets. Uh, you can see him on the right with his buddies in front of a 155 millimeter uh, mobile howitzer. He's the guy on the upper right with the, the big pecs. Uh, I met some of these gentlemen at the Homefront Cafe in Altamont, which I highly recommend people visit. Uh, the Homefront Cafe is not only a wonderful cafe right across the street from the Altamont train 
station, uh, but it's also a museum that shows a lot of World War II memorabilia. This is what the inside uh, looks like. It's an incredible place to visit. I can highly recommend it. Uh, I interviewed uh, Sal there and uh, Tom Smith and uh, included them in my book, which uh, is called We Were There, World War II Stories from the Adirondacks uh, Greatest uh, Generation. And uh, it uh, includes uh, 16 stories of 18 veterans and 160 pages with over 200 illustrations. Uh, and uh, it's got a, 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 some hair raising stories from all over the world, literally. And many pictures that I took on my trips to uh, um, uh, Pearl Harbor and uh, Normandy and many other places. So this is what, what uh, Iwo Jima looked like to uh, Sal Famulero and Tom Smith coming ashore in the, in the uh, loose uh, volcanic sand there. It was uh, just brutal. You can see all the ammunition fired by George's unit. The uh, duck is the uh, vehicle up in the upper left corner. That's the, the vehicle that uh, George had to come ashore on and lift the howitzer out of. Uh, you can see them on the lower right side firing uh, their howitzers at uh, Mount Suribachi. Uh, this is the, the men bringing the flag, uh, uh, planting the flag on the top of Mount Suribachi. Uh, Sal Famulero was probably uh, in a situation just like these men on the right side. All these are wounded men who are waiting to be carried back to uh, ships off, uh, offshore after having been wounded in the battle. Um, over uh, 6,000 men uh, died taking over the island. Uh, and these are just more pictures of the brutality of the battle on Iwo Jima. But, uh, and it took 36 days to conquer the island, but it only took uh, the Seabees, uh, the um, uh, American uh, engineers, uh, five days to start working on the captured airfield on the south end of the island. You can see Mount Suribachi in the background. And uh, so B-29s were already starting to land on Iwo Jima as soon as that airfield was uh, uh, in operational condition, even though the Japanese were still fighting and still con controlled uh, more than half the island. Um, but after all is said and done, the B-29 uh, became the most uh, destructive uh, and powerful weapon on Earth. Uh, up to that point. Uh, it could, its payload uh, could be varied uh, depending on the uh, type of mission. Uh, they would sometimes use 100-pound uh, uh, bombs in uh, huge numbers. 80 could be carried in one B-29, or 56 300-pound bombs, 40 500-pound bombs, 12 1,000-pound bombs, 8 2,000-pound bombs, or 4,000 4, pound bombs or one atomic bomb. Now the first B-29 to land on Iwo Jima was a, a, a bomber called uh, the Dynamite. It was on the 12th day of fighting. Uh, the Dynamite's fuel pump had failed and its bomb bay doors would not close completely. There was no way that bomber was going to get back to uh, uh, Tinian or uh, Saipan. Uh, it, uh, but they were able to catch uh, a the landing on film. Now the bomber had never been over Iwo Jima before. It didn't know where the airfield was. It had to fly over the island three times before it could safely land. Uh, the Japanese tried to shoot it down, but uh, they were unsuccessful. So let me see if I can get this to work here. This is the movie that was made of the B-29 landing on Iwo Jima. It's flying over the island right now with its landing gear down. It's just uh, reconnoitering where to land. And, and then it circled around Mount Suribachi, which is on the left. And it's now coming in for a landing. Uh, it's a little wobbly, as you can see. And these men on Iwo Jima had never seen a B-29. They had no idea how big this airplane could be. It, was, it, it literally took their breath away. They were flabbergasted when they saw this thing land. And as you will see in a moment, uh, they couldn't help themselves. They had to get a closer look at this monstrous airplane. Uh, those men were very happy to safely land on the island. This was hand, taken with a little hand-held, cranked, hand-cranked uh, eight millimeter movie camera by a GI photographer. And that's an L L5 uh, spotting plane in the foreground. Uh, 
which was used for artillery, calling in artillery. A crowd is gathering as the engines wind down. And you can see the mob that ended up uh, showing up there. In all, over 2,200 B-29s landed on Iwo Jima during the war. And uh, each B-29 had a crew of 10 men. So over 22,000 men probably owe their lives to uh, having taken Iwo Jima, even though the price we paid in men's lives was staggering, it still paid off uh, in the long run. Uh, although some of the landings uh, didn't uh, go so well, some of them ditched in the ocean nearby, some of them, uh, some of the planes broke apart and caught on fire as they hit the, uh, uh, hit the ground, but in general, uh, most of the time the crew could be uh, safely extracted. There was a hatch on the roof of the airplane that men could climb through if they were uh, submerged. Um, but um, so it was a hard won haven for the bomber on, on uh, Iwo. You can see again the Mount Suribachi in the background. That's ironically, that's a B-24 bomber taking off or landing, I'm not sure which in the background. Um, and it was also a repair shop as, a, as the war went on. Many B-29s had to be uh, repaired before they could return back to their home base. And uh, you can see uh, even uh, uh, pieces of the tail or wing would be used to replace uh, damaged uh, parts on airplanes. And if you look closely at the picture on the right, uh, that, that gaping hole in the side of the B-29 was caused by the propeller falling off the engine. You can notice that the uh, engine in the foreground has no propeller. That's because the engine caught on fire and it melted the propeller shaft. And when that happened, which it did often, the propeller would go flying into the fuselage of the airplane, as you can see, and ripping a huge hole in it. Uh, that probably caused many B-29s to go down. So despite all these uh, problems with the B-29, uh, Improvements in training, engine modifications, and better airfields did allow the B-29 to begin fulfilling its promise to end the war sooner. In May of uh, 1945, General LeMay uh, changed the strategy, as I had mentioned, to uh, incendiary bombs at low altitude. And uh, so the plan was to uh, do fire bombing. And the first uh, such mission was on May 9 and 10 of uh, 1945 was 278 B-29s in a 400 mile long stream, dropping over half a million pounds of firebombs on Tokyo over two and a half hours. The Japanese were caught totally by surprise and were defenseless in stopping and controlling the fire. So about 16 square miles of the city, which is about 40% of the city was turned to ashes. These are some of the pictures my father brought back from the uh, war, The on the left of the bombs you see falling are incendiary bombs. They're basically canisters filled with packets of napalm. When the bomb would hit the ground, the packets would sp spread all over the place and ignite spontaneously and just create these raging fires. And you can see the result in the picture on the right. Uh, these are pictures of bomb damage after a raid. You can see the white areas in the Nagoya uh, uh, picture showing those white areas. Those are all burned out areas of the city. Uh, here's a, a picture on the right showing uh, smoldering ruins and huge sections of the city, although you notice they deliberately tried not to hit the emperor's palace. They did not want to kill the emperor or destroy his palace because they had hopes that uh, they could uh, use the emperor uh, at the end of the war to restore law and order in the uh, country. And uh, although it sounds horrific to firebomb cities in this manner, uh, the uh, 20th Air Force did give cities warning ahead of time. Once, uh, once we kind of took care of the, the threat of Japanese fighter interference and any aircraft fire, uh, we would drop um, these leaflets over cities that would uh, warn the Japanese ahead of time uh, of the coming uh, raid and to get out of the uh, city. And it's interesting that uh, uh, it goes on to say that America is not fighting the Japanese people, but is fighting the military group which has uh, controlled the Japanese people. The peace which 
America will bring will free the people from the oppressive, the oppression of the military and bring the emergence of a new and better Japan. So, uh, so you can see that uh, this was dropped on the cities uh, ahead of time to give them a chance to uh, evacuate the cities. Uh, this, these pictures here uh, are the ultimate picture. These were top secret pictures. Uh, as you can see on the upper left, uh, it says top secret. That's because uh, that is a picture of Hiroshima uh, before the bombing. Uh, it's not clear to me whether that uh, cloud in the lower left was the atomic bomb. I think it was simply uh, regular clouds taken by the uh, reconnaissance aircraft before the bombing. But uh, the picture on the right shows what happened to the city after the atomic bomb. That white area, that light colored area is the extent of the bomb uh, destruction. And you can see it just, it destroyed the entire uh, city basically. Uh, these are maps. This is a map that um, my father's group made of uh, the Nagasaki attack, and he brought back uh, the strike photo of the atomic blast over Nagasaki. And um, by June 1945, the casualties in the Pacific were so horrific that uh, the atomic bomb was uh, developed to end the war sooner. Uh, you can see that the Marianas Islands. Uh, uh, caused the, the taking that uh, uh, those islands under control killed almost 3,000 uh, Americans, 10 and 10,000 wounded. Uh, the Japanese lost 57,000. Iwo Jima uh, lost. Uh, Japanese lost 19,000. We lost almost 7,000. Uh, Okinawa, which was April and June through June of 1945, the Japanese lost 110,000. Uh, we lost over. 12,500. Um, so every battle, as we got closer and closer to Japan, uh, was more deadly, with more casualties. And it was clear that we, if we had to invade the home islands of Japan, which consisted of 3,000 islands, including four major home islands, uh, the, uh, the Battle of Okinawa would look like a, a training skirmish in comparison. Uh, the U.S. military leaders estimated that America would suffer over a million casualties and the Japanese untold millions. Um, in the firebombing program, over 100,000 Japanese died, uh, more than Hiroshima and Nagasaki combined. But uh, by the time the Jap uh, Japan surrendered, uh, B-29s would have dropped over 104,000 tons of bombs on Japan, turning hundreds of square miles and 66 cities into rubble, leaving uh, over 9 million citizens homeless. But ultimately, the B-29 made the invasion of the home islands uh, unnecessary, saving perhaps a million American lives and ending the war one to two years sooner. Uh, the B-29 was used again in the Korean War, uh, but then retired. And uh, of the 4,000 that were built, only two are in flying condition today. So that's why the B-29 ended the World War II uh, and a year earlier, at least, than would have happened otherwise and saved a million lives. Now, uh, here's a place I can highly recommend visiting. This is the National Air and Space Museum at the Stephen Udvar Hazy Center uh, next to Dulles Airport in Chantilly, Virginia. Uh, these are my grandchildren standing guard over the entrance. Uh, this is what this, uh, the interior looks like. There's many warplanes on exhibit from World War II, including the, the famous or infamous Enola Gay, which dropped the first atomic bomb. And uh, it's important to visit these, these uh, museums and shrines. Uh, this is a picture I took at the uh, Normandy uh, Cemetery. And uh, the passage that always comes to my mind is that uh, those who cannot remember the past are bound to repeat it, and uh, that's more true than ever. And we can't let that happen for many reasons, including the lives of my grandchildren and everyone's grandchildren uh, are at stake if we are foolish enough to get into a, a hot war using the weapons we have today. Uh, it, it's uh, bad enough that we're battling a coronavirus epidemic, uh, which is a world war of its own, uh, but we certainly uh, can't afford to fight a, a, a hot shooting war with any other country uh, in the future 
or the humanity itself may be at stake. So that's the end of my talk. And uh, I thank everyone for hanging around and listening.